Heresy of the Ismailites, Authenticity and Analysis Introduction Throughout history, the Church has met the challenges of heresy and cultural pressure by formulating creeds to define the orthodox and biblical stance of the Church. It has been essential, however, for the Church to continually recontextualize the doctrines and creeds to apologetic means. For each country, for each century, as by its own unique forms of heresy, as with the development of the doctrine of the Trinity, better explanations and more precise language were needed in order to express doctrinal integrity and develop a doctrinal formula that would be consistent with scripture and description and descriptive of the two relationships between the unity of God and the distinctions within the three persons of the Trinity. As the first Christian theologians dealt with the aberrant theology of Trinitarian heresies, they were, they were able to retain the core of, the, of scriptural truth and wrap, it, uh, and wrap around it the contextual formula of the Trinity that rested of the incremental contributions of many other theologians as they all sought to be clearer in their explanations and more precise in their use of terms. This doctrine was then crystallized into creeds, but these creeds would still need to be reinterpreted in future times and recontextualized and a new as new misunderstandings challenge uh, challenge orthodoxy otherwise a fossilized creed were in, was in danger of being distorted of by, by a heterodox heterodox view and eventually subsumed by false doctrine this is what occurred in time of john of damascus when islam came to represent a challenge to cover the doctrines of the Christian of Christianity and to centuries or carefully constructed theology in defending the orthodox position, John needed us to summarize the doctrine of the Christian church up to the 8th century and then develop appropriate apologetic that would defend as well as reveal in this section the writings of John of Damascus on Islam well utilized, especially his explanation in defense of the Trinity to foster deeper understanding of the historical and apologetic nature of the first arguments on the Trinity between a Christian theologian and the Muslims. John's work in, in recontextualizing the doctrine of the Trinity in his defense of Christianity against Islam was significant for his own time and it also had a had far reaching effects of his on his successors. He summarized Christian doctrine systematically for his day based on prior work done by theologians who were also apologists. He was also the first major theologian to engage in a written apology with Islam to the works specifically crafted to defend Christianity against what he referred to as the heresy of Edesimalites. John's teaching on the Trinity revealed the standard of orthodoxy at this stage of the church of the church development. Together with his critique of Islam, John's works can therefore show how Trinitarian doctrine developed through the two previous councils and theological writing up and theological writings are through the type of these new challenges facing the facing the church. John Tolan in his chapter on in his chapter on early Eastern Christian creations to, is, to Islam notes that the body of John's extant writings number 1,500 1, pages and yet only about 12 of those pages deal directly with Islam. This page could many be, be misleading. However, since most of the 100 heresies of heresies John recorded were short paragraph descriptions while his treatment of heresy of the Ismailites must, was, much longer, must, was much longer. In addition, it is likely that most of what John wrote, especially apologetically, would have been written in, with Islam in mind. The importance of this material is underscored by Tolan when he proposed that these dozen pages on Islam provide a, a key glimpse at the formation, formation of an apologetic Christian response to Islam and the way to be read and reread and re -read by scores of later Christian writers as they attempted to come to them of with Islam. The text focused on by the study in part of John's Fund of Knowledge which he dedicated to Cosmas the newly installed Bishop of Mayuma 
in AD 743, it is divided into three major sections, the philosophical chapters on heresies and orthodox faith. The philosophical chapters, also, are also known as, dialect, as the dialectica, consist of 68 chapters and give a philosophical and rational basis to John's theological term. Much of the logic is borrowed from Greek philosophy and demonstrates, and demonstrates John's training in this field of knowledge. The 100 chapters which make up the third part, the Vida Orthodoxa, are often referred to as the first summa theologica of the Church. These chapters systematically summarize the orthodox conclusions of the key theologians who lived before John. Instead, indeed, John humbly states that at the beginning of his work that he will add nothing of his heart, but rather shall gather together into one those things which have been worked out by the most eminent of, te of teachers and make a compendium of them. It is his desire that the church demonstrates in this section will destroy deceit and put falsehood to, to flight. The falsehood that the falsehood that John referred is to found in the middle part can call on heresies the heresibus, and it is the part that, that concerns us now. Although ninety seven chapters can be traced back to, to earlier sources, especially eighty chapters from Epiphanius who was piece of Salamis in Kipus at the end of the 4th century, the last the, the last three are probably written by John. The particular heresy we will now turn to is titled the heresy of Ismailites. The heresy of the Ismailites, authorship and authenticity of the work. If John Treatise, her heresy of the Ismailites, were not written by John and were perhaps from a later period, then we would not be able to make any definitive statements from this text about the nature of the Muslim belief system in the first half of 8th century or indeed about the first 100 years after the, after the death of, the, of Muhammad in the year AD 632. However, if the work is authentic, then there are some critical assessments we can make about Islam, Muhammad in the Quran that may that may differ greatly from from the information that has been passed down to us from the Muslim sources, which that which that from the middle of the eighth century or at the earliest. Thus we should we should have an earlier eyewitness account from the pen of John that even that even the early Muslim seers and hadiths Andrew Lute stressed out the importance of John's work by saying that if these two works referring also to the disputation between Christian and Asaracen are indeed by John Damaskin or even if the arguments can be traced back to him, they constitute the earliest explicit discussions of Islam by a Christian theologian, Pim Falkenberg, goes so far as to say that since this text is one of the earliest Christian reflections on this phenomenon, and for a long time certainly the most influential one, John of Damascus, may be seen as the real founder of the Christian tradition concerning Islam. Robert Hoyland concurs with Lutz and Falkenberg and adds, if the chapter on Islam is genuinely by John of Damascus, it represents the earliest Greek polemical writing of, writing of against Islam, thus marking John the first apologist to the Muslims. There are two things to consider in regard to John's authorship of the chapter on Islam and, the, and the authenticity of his work. The first deals with whether he even wrote the section of on 100 heresies which included which included the chapter on Islam and the seven days specifically with his authorship of the chapter on Islam. We will first consider John's authorship of the heresy books as a whole. One of the reason one of the reason that his authorship of the Harisibus is considered polemic, poly, problematic is that some of the earliest manuscripts of the phone knowledge 
Point of knowledge do not contain the section of the harasses and all the and all those places. Place the section on harass at the end as if it were a late tradition. However, in John's papers to his point of, of knowledge, he stated that he would provide a section between the, the dialectica and the divide orthodoxa, consisting of the various harasses that Christians has have faced. Then next after this I shall set forth in order to have the absurdities of the heresies hated by God, so that by recognizing that lie, we may more closely follow the truth. Clearly, this indicates that John intended to have the section on heresies situated before the section of the author on the Orthodox Spirit, so that he could provide a contrasting view for what he believed for what he believed would be the superior beliefs found in true Christianity. Therefore, those copies that either excluded the section on harasses or place it at the end of, of the collection were not congruent with the original intent of the author. Andrew Lutz has his own theory as to how these discrepancies can be explained. In trying to put the piece of the puzzle together, Lutz believes that the structure of guns, John's Form of knowledge or perigenosius development developed over time. Since a number of the early redentions of the form of knowledge or only only contained the dialectica and the and and the feed the video orthodoxa, which follows the standard pattern of one hundred and fifty chapters, such as what is present in the earlier doctrina patrum or the teaching of the fathers. And since there are some early manuscripts that attach the section of heresies at the, at the end, Lutz conjectures that John may have written the Dialectica and the, the Video Orthodoxa at an earlier time in his life, perhaps in 720s or 730s, and then decided to include them in a longer three-part work later on. It was at this time that John would have written the preface which mentions that the work would be in the three parts with the section of the heresies in the middle. This could have taken place around 743, which is indicated in the preface, or it could have been written between the time the time and his death around 750. Since Lord indicates that John never finished revising, revising the first section on the dialectics. For Luth, for Luth, this would be tied up some of the loose ends, such as the appearance of the heresy bus, as, as chapter 34 in a manuscript of the Doctrina Patrum, as well as, be, as, well as being tacked on, the, on to the end of some of the manuscripts of the Dialectica and the Divide Orthodoxa. However, even if there were different stages involved in John's masterpiece, it does not in any way neg negate the fact that he got all, the thre all three sections and merely put them together in an early and late form with a later three-part format outlined in his preface. Finally, we can rest our case on the basis on the critical decision and zone of, of John Walks, John's work by the Bonafatius Cotter since he has verified that the earliest copies of the form of knowledge not only contain the section of the heresy was, but also place it between the dialectica and the and the video orthodoxa just as John has outlined in the preface. We we will now we will now consider the chapter on Islam on Islam itself and whether John actually wrote it or whether it was spent by a later order. The authenticity of the heresy of the Ismailites has been considered problematic because the best known version of the heresy was published in Minas Patrologia Greca, considered, considered of 130 chapters instead of 100. Heresy of the Ismailis was listed as, a num as number 101. Edgar Lutz argued that these chapters would conform to the monastic literary, literary genre of the time and be compromised and compressed a century of 100 chapters. Bonifatius Cotter, in a new critical edition of John's writings, contest Minya's view that there were 103 heresies and reveals that 
the original was composed of 100 chapters with the one entire heresy of the Ismailis and the final one. This conclusion is based somewhat on an early manuscript from the Nins of the 10th or 10th century which concludes the 100 chapters with a chapter on Islam. In his critical edition of John's work, Cotter says that, Cotter says that Heresy 100 may have been written as a separate work by John and then attached to an earlier collection such as Epipanius Panarion. He also, he also says that the use of 100 chapters followed the common practice of trying to complete a century of chapters. Thus, John may have pulled together the earlier heresies from other, from other sources and then rounded them off with some time, some things that, that he had already written. Of great significance is Cotter's conclusion that the, that the, the heresy was, including chapter 100 on the Ismailites, is contained in a nin of 10th century manuscript GL 315 of MS Moscow Synod. Robert Highland reinforces this conclusion by adding that there is a florilegium flori that includes the first two paragraphs of John's work and it is dated even earlier than the 19th century. In contrast, Daniel Sahas, writing in 1972, details the objections of Ahmad Abel, who argues that the heresy of Ismailis was the first part of a work by the 12th 13th century Byzantine writer Niketas Acominatus. One of the main problems in Abel's argument, however, is that the objections he raised as to, he raised as to why John could not have been the author as actually dealing with material that was later added to the earlier original account. Thus, even Sass concludes at the end of his discussion that what can be said at this point with certainty is that this text was already known as a few was already known a few decades after the after the writing of the Vaughan of Knowledge, which is an attested work of John of Damascus, and that it has been attributed to him since the, since then. This seems sufficient justification for us to discuss chapter one hundred one of as John of Damascus work. Raymond Leco concludes with Sarah in his assessment of Albert's argument and also points out that the first part of the Tesserus by Acominatus, the part that should proper, properly be attributed to John, portrays the monk who helps Muhammad, Muhammad as an anonymous Aryan monk rather than the monk Bahira, who is first mentioned in Ibn Isaac Sirat, written after John's death. Thus, after uh, thus, since the writer of the first part of the Tesserus, presumably John, is unaware of the later tradition, which views the monk as Nestorian rather than Aryan, this can be seen as another piece of internal evidence for an early death for the first part of the work. It can also be used as evidence that Acominatus incorporated this earlier work by John into his later elaboration. Finally, in consideration of Cotter's conclusions in regard to his manuscript studies, the consensus of scholars at this time is that the treatise titled The Heresy of the Ismailites and listed as the one hundred as the one hundredth chapter in a series of heresies collected as well as authored by John of Damascus in his larger work called The Font of Knowledge is indeed authored by John of Damascus. The significance for us then is that we can now use the text in order to determine not only what an informed Christian would not have would have known about Islam in the first half of eighth century, but also what arguments were being used against the Muslims by the Christians. We will now look at his work in six sessions. Context of the heresy of Ismailites Origins of the Saracen religion. In the first section of chapter 100, John refers to the coercive religion of the Ismailites, which, the, which is the forerunner of the Antichrist. Having used strong words in his description of the religion of the Ismailites, it is curious that John refers to them as a heresy of Christianity rather than a false religion. Daniel Sahas 
cautions that the word haggis in John of Damascus needs to be understood in a, in a much broader sense, that, sense than it is used today as a deviation from mainstream orthodoxy. This is because John includes John includes twenty heresies, which he calls the model of heresy, the models of heresies at the beginning of his list of one hundred, even though their pre Christian belief systems Hoyland had Hoyland adds that evidently then the term simply signifies an erroneous belief of a false doctrine. For John, Christianity is seen as a, as the truth and the standard and the standard by all, by which all other religions or culture should should be judged. Whenever a religion proclaims something that is contrary to the Bible or a distortion of its truth, it is then deemed to be heretical. Sars concludes then that the heresies are heresies in so far that are can be incontested into to the to Christianity. This they are discussed in reference to Christianity not independently of it, thus the justification of treating Islam as a heresy too. That may be the case. However, we also need to remember that at the time there, there were no references to a universal religion called Islam, but rather that the conquering people group referred to as Ismailites, Saracens or Hagarans, exposed beliefs the other traditions that seem to be distorted extraction from the extractions from the two major religions in the area, Judaism and Christianity. It may be that during the first half of the 8th century, the religion that was to become Islam was still in its formative process, and the rules, the traditions, and the Quran may still have been developing as the Arabs, ab as the Arabs absorbed more and more land, money, and power. Thus, Islam, what was not very distinct from Christianity in the time of, J of John of Damascus, and it is only in the later half of the 8th century when the earliest biographies on Muhammad were being written in the first hadith, in the first hadith were being penned that the finalization of the Quran was also taking place and the distinctions were becoming sharp and more divine, both in a theological and cult in, in a cultural sense. For example, in the first section of his treatise, John refers to the Arabs by three titles, Hagarans, Ismailis, and Saracens. The term Hagarin, of course, comes from the belief that the Arabs descend, descended from, from Abraham's son, from Abraham's son, Ismail, whose mother was Hagar. The term Ismailit will also connect them to Abraham, who is also the ancestral father for the Jews and the Christians. Yet, the two, this, these two terms and in themselves do not make any do not make a connection to the universal religion of Islam. Even the term Saracens, a favorite term for the Arabs at the time, again only profess a familiar kinship with other descendants of of Abraham. The actual the actual origin of the term is unknown, but John portrays it as a coming from the Ephesus of Christian of the for the verses from the verses on scripture when Sarah sent Hagar and his smile and his smile away empty so John placed on the fourth kenny to cast away which together with Sarah will give us the word Sarah kenny or Sarah sends. whatever the case Andrew Lutz Believes, believes that John's etymologists still only identify Islam as the religion of the Arabs, which is historically sound for the Umayyad period, to the contrary to the, to the portrayal of Islam in the Quran as a, as a universal religion. It is important to note that John was probably writing, in, writing, writing, this, was probably writing this in the early 740s, so it is likely that the religion that became Islam was not seen as a distinctive enough to be called anything more than a distant relative of, of Judaism or in John, John's eyes, a strange administer of twisted, erroneous beliefs, beliefs coming from both Judaism and Christianity. In other words, a heresy. John even alludes to a time when the Saracens once worshipped idols in Arabia, apparently referring to Aphrodite and the Morning Star.
in the pre in pre-Islamic times, the Arabs apparently worship the morning stars, the morning star as Al Uzza, one of their three main goddesses as or daughters of Allah. The reference to the to the three goddesses is found in the Quran in Surah 53, 19, 20. Also, along with the names of the two of the two, along with the names of the other two, Allah and Manat. In John's treatise, Afrodite is referred to twice, once near the beginning and once toward the end. Both times, she is linked with the Arab word Kabar, Greek Kabar, which John's, which John says means great. He then, he then reminds his reader, his readers to the that the Saracens remain the idolaters up and idolaters up until the time of Heraclius. When they when there appeared a false prophet named Muhammad or Muhammad who developed the new heresy. In this next section, in this next section, John indicates that this false prophet Muhammad only knew that only knew the Old Testament and New Testament superficially and probably learned aspects of his heresy from an alien monk. It is interesting to note that. John does not refer to the monk as the Nestorian Nistor, monk named Bahira, who is mentioned in Ibn Isaac's Hirat, Ibn Isaac's Hirat at a later time. This would indicate, perhaps, that John is unaware of any tradition of Muhammad traveling to Syria and meeting a monk who claimed to recognize the son of a prophet in Muhammad. However, since he does, he does mention the involvement of a monk, this could indicate an earlier redemption of the story before it took on the Nostrian persuasion and the monk was given a name. As with the comparison of early and late hadiths, when a story contains more specific references to people or events, it is usual as indication that the story has been embellished through the, pass the passage of time and the earliest version is the more correct one. Also, in linking Muhammad to Arianism, John perhaps is indicating that he recognizes the essence of the Muslim objection to Christianity since Arianism denies that Jesus Christ is consubstantial with the Father, making Jesus only a created being, much as the Muslim argued that God, that God could not have any associates. If this is the case, is it possible that what became Islam grew out of partial mixture of the Arian heresy? and other Semitic, Semitic influences. This could also explain explains John's tendency to call it a heresy rather than a false religion. John also finds fault with Muhammad's rumor that the scriptures that he gave to his people when brought down from heaven without witnesses, even though all the ordinary acts such as a marriage as, as such as marriage and buying property required witnesses. The real travesty, according to John, was that Muhammad then expected his followers to obey the pronouncements which, in John's estimation, were worthy only as of, of Luther. This knowledge of the transmission of the teachings of Muhammad from heaven, however, reflects that in the time of John, there was at least recognition of the existence of some type of scriptures that the Arabs collected and followed. In the last section, the actual surahs that John may be citing will be explored. One of the most important features may be what is actually missing from John's overview. He does not seem to have any historical awareness of the life of Muhammad, where he was from, his struggle in Mecca, his departure to Medina, the early, the early formation of the Muslim community, or even the many rest of the local caravans, anything that would give any indication as to what kind of person Muhammad was. Even though Muhammad is mentioned by name only four times in the Quran, these are stories that should have been in circulation at the time since Ibn Ishaq d. 767, the first biographer of Muhammad would have been collecting information on Muhammad from a number of John's contemporaries. They John consider these historical matters as merely inconsequential or was he just in ignorant of them? Were any of these stories in circulation during his lifetime or were they waiting to be built 
do the pain of Ibn Ishaq and others who followed. It is also interesting to note that to note that John is not John did not seem to be aware of any arguments for Muhammad's prophethood based on stories or miracles that Muhammad performed, such as his miraculous night journey on the back of a winged horse to the city of Jerusalem. John merely mentions that the Saracens should seek witnesses or to verify the so-called revelations of the prophet. Since these references to Muhammad's miracles were used in Christian Muslim dialogues in the later 8th century and to the 9th century, this may be another indication for a mid 8th century authorship of this treatise. Muhammad's teaching on Christ. John also detects that the core of the first belief is the Saracen portrayal of the one God without any associations. At this point, John seems to be referring to Surah 112, 1 and 3 on or the Surah Ali class, which says, according to John, that there is one God, creator of all things, who has neither been begotten nor has begotten. It is interesting to note that to note that John has the order refers here from the way that it is found on the, in the Quran. He is using the different resource, or is he reciting from memory, or is he just trying to recollect what he has heard from the Saracens? He also may be alluding to Surah, to surah 4, 171, and perhaps Surah 19, 16 until 30, when he, where he refers to the Saracen belief that Christ was the word of God and his spirit, but only a creator and a servant, and that he was born without seed for Mary, the sister of Moses and Aaron. Or, on the other hand, John may refer to Surah 4, 156, 156-158. When he realized that Jesus, with a human father, was born a prophet, and that the Jews unlawfully wanted to crucify him, but after arresting him, they only crucified his shadow, for he says the curse was not crucified, nor he did, nor he did, he, nor did he die, for God took him out to himself into heaven, because because he loved him. In heaven, Jesus denies telling the people that he was the Son of God, as well as God himself, which is similar to dialogue found in Surah 5, 116 FF. This understanding shows that John has knowledge of at least portions of the Quran around AD 743. It is also important to note that he would have been referring, referencing an Arabic version since the earliest Greek translation postdated him. In his treatise, it is almost it is almost as if John is trying to develop as apologetic against his, against this new threat to Christianity by demonstrating, on the uh, on the one hand, how inaccurate the theological positions of this new religion are, when countered by the truth of Christianity. On the other hand, how utterly foolish are some two of the things that are recorded by Muhammad, the so the so called prophet, in regard to this last statement. John writes that Muhammad spread rumors that the book had been sent down to him from heaven by God, but the heretical pronouncements inscribed in his book were only worthy of Luther. In John's first counter-argument, he deals with the main objections that Saracen have to Christianity. Belief in the Trinity, belief in the deity of Jesus Christ, and belief that Jesus really died, really, really did die on the cross and then rose triumphantly from death. Realistically, re realistically speaking, the, these are these are the cardinal doctrines of the of the church. Saracen, the, the Saracens thought, however, that God could not be a Trinity since He has neither been begotten nor has begotten. All, although they admitted that Christ is the Word of God and His Spirit, they believed that the greatest sin, which they referred to as sin, to as sin which is, was, uh, was to associate God with a created being. Therefore, since they believed that Christ was only a created being, it was sick. 
to say that he was also in very nato god the conclusion that jesus died on the cross was also problematic for an admission to actual crucifixion would open the door to the understanding that christ therefore died for our sins which only good which only god could do in the next counter argument John really calls the Saracen story of Jesus denying his deity before God when he arrives in heaven. According to the story, God kisses Jesus after he is miraculously swept into heaven to avoid the crucifixion and says, Oh Jesus, did you say that I am the Son of God and God? Of course, according to the story, Jesus vehemently denies that he ever said such a thing and assures God that it was a little a lie told by those who, has, who had turned away from God and the truth. This must have been something that the sagas and brought up in, the, in their arguments, and rather than contact the release uh, with a review to the up of the applicable passages in the Bible, John merely sweeps it. John merely sweeps it aside, aside as a saying that is only worthy of Luther. In the area of prophethood. John confronts the Saracen's argument that Muhammad is the true prophet of God and therefore should be heeded. According to the Bible that both the Jews and the Christians use, there are three conditions for prophet of God. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 17 until 22, for example, deals with the sign of, the, of a prophet and states that, and states that if a so-called if a so-called prophet says that something will take place and it does not take it does not take place and he's a pro false prophet the if and indications that muhammad ever dealt with this type of prophecy more muslims would say however that muhammad is a prophet because he was given the recitation known of the quran john makes the point that if muhammad were a true prophet then he should have a good with a with, the, with all the earlier prophets, as well as Moses, who, who foretold the coming to Christ. They not only foretold his coming, but they would have agreed with the view that Christ is God, the Son of God, and that he would be crucified and die and rise again, and that he will be the judge of the living and the dead. This belief, these beliefs, however, were denied by Muhammad, well, John asks why the prophet did not come in this way, and with this knowledge they only struck and say, God does as he pleases. John's critique on Mo of Muhammad's teaching. In the next in this next section, John criticizes Muhammad criticizes Muhammad's claim of receiving the scriptures while he was asleep and without any witnesses. They struck they struck John as specious since the Saracens require witnesses for many other transactions such as marriage and acquiring property in regard to this, he says, on the one hand, you take wives and possess property and, uh, and donkeys and everything else through witnesses, yet on the other hand, you accept your faith and your scriptures unwitnessed. For the one who has handed down the script the scripture to you has no verification from any from any source, nor is there any prior witness to him now. Furthermore, he received this while asleep. John chides the Saracens for requiring witnesses for almost everything else, from marrying a woman to buying an animal to acquire property, but from the but from the most important thing is this is the belief is the lives, the relation with God, they did not require witnesses to verify the writings of Muhammad. Even more that they accepted that what he said was revealed to him in his sleep. Therefore, John ridicules them for accepting the revelation which he says may have only been a dream. John also criticizes Muhammad's teaching on Jesus Christ and his relationship with God and the Father. According to the religion of Muhammad, Christians are called associators for ascribing upon their son to God. John in turn calls them mutilators for tearing apart for tearing a part of the Trinity, for he, for he reasons that if God's word and spirit are taken away from him, then he is less than God. Indeed, if there were a time when God need not have his word or his spirit, John agrees that God 
would have been incomplete. If God then attached himself out to the word and the spirit, something would have been added to him and therefore he would have been changed. However, change is something that or is something that only a creator can experience, not the creator. Thus, in order for in order for God to have always been the creator rather than the created being, he must have always has his word and spirit, which which necessity which necessitates the eternal the eternal nature of his word, Jesus Christ. The Sarah said that Christian that said that Christians were associados etai eteriastas eteriastas Be, because they introduce in addition to God upon them by saying that God is the son and is the son of God and God. Today the worst sin that anyone can commit in Islam referred to as shirk is to associate one of God's creatures with God himself. For Muslims this gen, this denigrates God. John may not have been aware for the full extent of sick in his time, but he will context the misinterpretation of the Son of God by reminding the Saracens that the book claims that Christ is Word and Spirit of God. Therefore, since God's Word and His Spirit cannot be separated from Him, then Christ must also be God, for otherwise they are mutilating Him by tearing up Him apart. Mark Baumon Mark Baumon feels that this was a good move for John by John 4. Denial of this argument by Muslims would result in an adequate understanding of the nature of God so that Christians can say if on the other hand that this is outside of God then God according to you is without word and without spirit in just logic since Muhammad since Muslims wish to deny that God that Christ is God they have to accept the word and spirit are spirit of from God as a result of the appearing of Christ. Christians can drive the point home. Thus trying to avoid making associates to God, you have mutilated him. Indeed, John contacts the accusation of Christians being associates by accusing the by the Saracens of being mutilators or copte from coptas. His next objection is that Christians are said to be idolaters by the Ismailis because Christians fed the rest of the cross. So John inquires how the Ismailis may escape the charge of idolatry since they kiss and rub themselves against the stone in the Kaaba after the simple set by Muhammad himself. John ridicules the actions by relating how some Saracens even believe that the stone was the place where Abraham had sex with Hagar, and others said it was it was where he tied up his camel when he was about to sacrifice Isaac. If they were to, John says, the Saracens should feel ashamed of venerating the stone rather than take part in the misguided revolution. He also indicates that the stone was probably once the head of a statue of Apollo which was used in previous pagan worship of the goddess. In contrast to this objectionable practices of these merits, John states that it is much better to show reference to the cross of Christ through which the power of demons and the deception of the devil have been destroyed. John also criticizes the Ismailites for locating Abraham's sacrifice of Isa in Arabia rather than Jerusalem, since the former would not offer the abundance of trees for easy retrieval of the needed wood. In addition, the writings of Muhammad mention camels, while the biblical account mentions only donkeys. These discrepancies only increase John's disdain for the account of the Ismailites in all these arguments, in all these arguments, John is either trying to demonstrate why he considers the superiority of Christianity or the foolishness of the religion of Muhammad, more for the sake of boasting belief in Christianity in the eyes of his Christian readers than for offering detailed arguments against the new heresy, though he is interested in countering their false belief, the Quran and the Surahs used. In this first section, in this fifth section, June refers to the scriptures of the Ismailites and the doctrines of Muhammad. 
especially as they are related in folk suras. In fact, he refers primarily to the to the to three Medina suras: Sura four, woman, the Anis Al Nisa; Sura five, the table Al Maida; Sura two, the Haifa Al Bakara. And a sugar is not there. And a sugar is not in the Quran. The sea camel, though there are allusions to the story in other surahs. In the books, in the book, in the book, Jordan identifies as the woman he presents in his description, in a way that emphasizes the foolishness of the practices involved. First of first of all, she deals with polygamy, which she says is a lot. But only for the man, the husband is is a lot up for four. Is a husband is a lot up to four wives, and he may also have one thousand concubines. However, the woman can only have one one husband. Clearly, John is trying to show the lasciviousness of this religious beliefs. He brings up the example of Zaid, Muhammad's adopted son-in-law, divorcing his wife Zainab. Who is not mentioned by name, so that Muhammad could satisfy his lust and marry her. Interestingly, John's story of Zaid and his divorce and his divorce is more detailed than uh, detailed than what is found in the Quran. Could it have been a story circulating around and then later written down by Ibn Ishaq? Ishaq? And could it have been an actual redemption by Ibn Ishaq? That John has had changed upon. John also seems to delight in demonstrating how ridiculous it, how ridiculous it is for Muhammad to reason that it is fine for a man to divorce his wife, but if he wants to marry her again, he must wait. He must wait until she has married and been divorced by another. It is also, it is also important to note that John accused Muhammad. Of committing adultery with Zaid, Zaid's wife, before he made the law making it illegal, making it legal, or actually God granting special conditions to Muhammad, John, then John then alludes to to even more immorality that is to of sense, of sin for him to mention, and then moves on to the next point of ridicule. The Camel of God is not a separate surah in the Quran. Though parts of the story are found in several surahs, John elaborates in the, in the telling of the story so that he can bring about the pinnacle point of his expose of foolishness to his readers. Yehuda Nivo even, even reminds his readers that this, that this story is not in the Quran. Though there are references to it in Surah 7, Surah 7, Chapter 73, 77, and 91, 13, until 14, Nivo also mentions that John devotes more attention to this, to this account than any other canonical Surah, specifically for the purpose of ridicule. In this tale, John narrates that, in this tale, John narrates the story of a camel from God that drank a whole rider and then could not pass between the two mount between two mountains. Since water was gone, the sea camel offered her milk to the people looking for water. But they but they were weak people and after a time they killed her. However, what of her offspring? A small sea camel survived. And John makes just of her situation. He asks the Saracens a series of questions about where the camel may have come from and who gave it birth, since apparently the camel is without father, without mother, without genealogy. Either John is alluding to a biblical character such as Melchizedek, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, or he is trying to bring out the rationality of the story. He realized that the smaller camel is taken up, is taken up to paradise by God, and he uses this situation to ridicule the view of paradise. For if the camel is in paradise, then she may ring up the river of water, one of the three rivers 
diseases of peace and death, water, milk and wine. However, the Quran mentions a fourth river of honey, Q 47.15. Also, John implies that if all the water is gone, and they end up drinking out of the river of wine with the water to dilute it, then they will become drunk, fall asleep and miss out on the pleasures of paradise. However, the Quran the river of wine will not intoxicate anyone. Q 37.47 At the end of the story, he is the famous God had the of the Sarasians and has entered into the source of the God of the Mokish. So that in place, the rest of the world is in which they have continued to follow the full words of the Bible. John then makes a great question of the use of the most part, the devil and the God. As far as the reference to the devil is concerned, John is a good one in what the truth says. God secrets the devil from God. The text of the heresy was reveals that John was familiar with many Arab traditions and part but not all of the, of the Quran. In our opinion, 
It supports Meyendorf's conclusion, con Meyendorf's conclusions that John knew only the sugars he paraphrased notes two five plus some plus some locutions which also appear in the Quran but probably attended it. Sahas attempt to show that to show that he had a detailed knowledge of whole of the no, of the whole Quran are somewhat far fetched and do not refute the supposition that what supposition that what John actually knew were some of the stories and ideas on which the Quran was was also based or from which it was compiled. The most interesting aspect of John's account to us is that he relates to the Quranic materials as a separate book, not as one book, and that he presents a story called The Kingdom of God as one of these books. It is interesting that for Suras, he is somewhat familiar with what are with are all from the so-called Meninan period, which was considered to be revealed to Muhammad in the later period of his life when he was living in Medina. It is also curious that John limits his critique of the Ismailite religion to this particular sources. This could mean that Nivo and Mayendorf are correct in their assessment that John only knew some of the surahs as well as a limited number of stories concerning Muhammad that were circulating at the time. At the time. However, John spent at least the first 40 years of his life in the needs of the Saracen stronghold. It's only logical to conclude that he must have been well informed in regard to the prevailing writings and doctrines of the Saracens. Therefore, the limited selection of sugars and stories may simply be explained by John not having access to the to a Quran, to a Quran in the monastery, and therefore relying on his memory of discussions that he may have had while while a civil servant in, Dasm in Damascus. It could also it could also indicate that while there have been much more that he could say, he may have felt that he made his point, and it would be unnecessary to go on. It certainly would have been helpful for us today if he would have written more on these subjects. But this is of the Saracens. John's heresy of the Ismailites closes with a list of Muslim customs and practices such as the circumcision of men and women, orders not to observe the Sabbath, orders not to be baptized, contradictory, of, of the, contradictory orders to eat certain forbidden foods, and to abstain from other foods that were permissible, and absolute order not to drink any wine. John does not comment on these practices, but he may have selected them in order to show polemically how each practice is contrary to the truth of Christian teaching. For example, in the Bible, in the Bible, circumcision was instituted as a sign of God's covenant to Abraham and demonstrated to the surrounding people that the descendants of Abraham were set apart from the world for God's blessings and purposes. It was only commanded for males. Therefore, the practice of circumcision for the Saracens, which included both males and females, negated the connection to God's covenant with Abraham and merely made it, it, and made it a barbaric practice with no spiritual context. The authors, not to observe the Sabbath and not to be baptized, were easily understood to be directly against the practice of worship on Sunday for Christian for Christians and Jews on Saturday. The Saracen leaders, in other words, were forcing their followers to turn away from the established days of worship, of worship and replace Christianity and Judaism with another belief, belief system that required a different day of worship. John may have considered the religion of the Ismailites to only be a heresy of Christianity rather than a fully separate religion, but he was keenly aware of how the counterpart the contact practices would lead to a further rejection of Christian doctrines and replacement of all, of all the Christian practices. The Saracen practice, practice of eating foods forbidden by Jews and Christians may have mostly targeted by the Jewish dietary regulations since Christ had given Peter and the four Christians approval to eat anything. The shift in eating habits could be construed 
as an attack on everyday common practices that would eventually separate people groups more definitively than even some spiritual disciplines. The abstinence from foods that were permissible is a curious dictat unless it would include, a part, include practices such as the partaking of the bread in the communion service, which, doubt, which no doubt would be, have been sung by the Saracen. This action would have further alienated the Saracen from the Christian. This may also have been on John's mind, where he concluded that this is with the total abstinence from wine, where wine was used in the central focus of the Mass and represented the very sacrifice of the Lord Christ. However, the Saracens did not believe that Jesus died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins, and therefore they would find the Lord's Supper abhorrent to their own beliefs. Surely, there were other no practical re reasons that the, Saracen, that the Saracens abstained from drinking wine, but John may have also realized that this early rejection of Christian practices, such as partaking bread and wine in the communion service, would lead to other, to other major rejections of Christian doctrine. It is very possible that he had witnessed a number of these paradigm shifts taking place in his life, both in his role as a, a civil servant in the court of the Caliph and also from the his distant observation was in the desert outside of Jerusalem. And, def and therefore, decide that, decide that his Christian readers would also be aware of the dangers the Saracen, the Saracen practices represented. What does John know about Islam? At the end of his detailed explanation of John's heresy on, of these merits, Daniel Sahar summarizes what John knows about Islam. He presents the, fact of the facts about Islam in an orderly and systematic way. Although not at all complementary, he demonstrates an accurate knowledge of the religion, perhaps higher than the one that an average Muslim could possess. He is aware of the cardinal doctrines and com con concept in Islam, and concept in Islam, especially those which are which are of an immediate interest of the Christians. To a, to a Christian, he knows well his success and he is at home with the Muslim mentality. Others concur with Sahas in regard to John's expert knowledge of this area. Hoyland, Hoyland contends that John is well informed about Islam, about the Islam of his days, of his day. This composition exerted great influence upon the knowledge, the, the language, tone, and content of such second Byzantine polemic against Islam. The subject of Christology, Muhammad's prophet, the Muhammad's prophethood and scripture, worship of the cross and Muslim sensuousness, as, an evident, as, a, as evidenced by the story of Seth and the description of paradise, were all to future time and time again, and to be presented in the same hostile fashion. But too unsympathetic, but too unsympathetic, the author is well informed. Andrew Lut also believes that John has a fairly accurate picture of early Islam, for he does Muhammad correctly and knows about the revelations that came to form the Quran. He seems to know that of the Quran as a book and knows as and knows certain of the surahs, though he appears to be mistaken about the camel of God. Though much of the story he relates in is authentic enough, his summary of, his, of Muslim teaching, especially as it affects Christian beliefs, is accurate, and his account and his account of the charges of Muslim, charge Muslims make against Christians is precisely what what one would expect. Though John's reply seemed to reveal some misunderstanding of Muslim parties. If this, if this express in the field are correct, then John's assessment in his heresy of these merits demonstrates a fairly accurate knowledge of the religion and the founder, and reveals that he is aware of some of the main doctrines of the religion, especially in regard to Christ. He also knows some of the sugars which must have been available in some form at the time. However, there are also a number of traditions and practices that he is not aware of, 
such as Nestorian monk, Bahira, and his me understandings on some points that should have been known by a scholar in those times, especially one living in the presence of the Caliph. It may be that John was writing from his memory of conversations with Muslims and therefore did not and therefore did not have readily available of a copy of the of a copy of the Quran which had not been translated into Greek until after John's death, or it may have been that there was so much to write about there that he needed to be selective. Whatever the case, John's critique of Islam indicates that he did not have a high regard for the beliefs of the Ismailites nor for the scriptures. As a result of this study, it is tempting to agree with Andrew Lutz when he says that he is tempted to go further down the pathway and look at an idea that has been advanced by scholars such as Patricia Kuhn and Michael Cook which gives a different account of the God and development of early Islam according to this idea. Islam was not fully formed by the time of the death of Muhammad in 632 but was in part a reaction to the success of the Arab conquest of the Middle East in the 630s and 640s from a movement inspired by apocalyptic Judaism emerging Islam distinguished and separated itself from Judaism and found its identity in the revelations made to Muhammad, the development of the religion took some decades and only towards the end of the 7th century there is something recognizable as Islam emerged. John's account, if written about the, tur about the turn of the century, will fit with such a picture, the clear sense of Islam as a pseudo prophetic religion focusing on the unity and the transcendence of God. John's understanding of Islam as finding its identity in Ismail as opposed to Isaac is rather the fluid awareness of the scriptural status of the revelations made to Muhammad, awareness of written translations, most but not all of which were soon to find their place in the book of the Quran, all that all this fits such a, such a picture. Which Andrew Lut concludes, but here is not the place to pursue this topic any further. This actually with what by further research involving John's first hand account needs to pick up the pursuit. John's picture of Islam in the early X century coincides with a number of details from the twentieth century neo revisionist view to the development of early Islam. This may be coincidental or it may indicate that John's account may help us better contextualize a 21st century understanding of an 8th century dilemma, almost 1,300 ago, 1, years ago. John of Damascus first developed, an, his, first developed his apologetic approach to Islam. The first step in this approach was to fully understand the Sarah's and beliefs. The next step provides an explanation as to how the Christian scriptures and doctrine contact those beliefs. He also provided us he also provided a recontextualist rationale for dispute doctrine doctrines such as the Trinity and the deity of Christ. As a result of his initiative, John led the way in developing an apologetic that was used for centuries after he died.